A salty tradition gives way to current and thriving recording artists now on BBC4. Gareth Malone travels the British Isles uncovering the shanties and sea songs which provide the soundtrack to our hardy and windswept coastline. In South Australia I was born ah, heave away, haul away South Australia ran came home With bound for South Australia Haul away, haul away, haul away, haul away, haul away, haul away The inspiring story of Britain's maritime past has a hidden history of song As I went down one morning there So choir master and singer Gareth Malone is travelling our coast to explore this unique heritage <laughs> Hello, I'm Gareth. Hello. Good to meet you. Hi. Oh, for a ribbon, Ranzo. Ranzo, my You'll discover the sailors' shanties that began as work songs and grew to become haunting reminders of lost loved ones and heroes of the sea. Clear and whole, lads, clear and whole. Capable of uniting whole communities. To be the kind of person about whom songs are written, you know, because you went out to sea and, and saved lives. I mean, that's incredible. As you hunted for the shores ahead But what are the stories that lie behind Britain's Songs of the Sea? These songs could end up just fading away and staying on a, on a shelf, but because these guys really believe in them and really love them, they are kept alive and kept fresh. Sir Henry Wood's Fantasia, a staple of the last night of the proms. And a chance to celebrate Britain's proud seafaring achievements with this tribute to the Battle of Trafalgar. But for Gareth, it wasn't these stirring orchestral pieces that first inspired him. I'll sing you a song of the fish of the sea and we're bound for the river. Instead, it was songs of the sea, captured in a book that had been passed down through his family. So fare ye well, my pretty young girl, for we're bound for the Rio Grande. Songs that have since fallen out of fashion. This book has been around for the last hundred years. It's a sort of national songbook, and it's full of sea songs. And they're the sort of songs that I learnt when I was a child, and my parents used to sing. And they're very different from the last night of the proms, where you get a much more sort of grandiose version of the sea. I think what's lovely about these is that there's, there's salt in them. You can hear the wind, you can really feel that they are songs of experience. They are a little looking glass into the past. You can really, you can really understand how people lived and how they felt about themselves as people of the sea. Gareth wants to rediscover this singing tradition. And he's starting his journey in Portsmouth. 200 years ago, Portsmouth was at the heart of Britain's empire and commerce. And nearly a third of our ocean-going trade left from these shores. Bernie Davis is a folk singer with a passion for sea shanties. Yes. And permission to come on board. His great-grandfather was a sailor, and his knowledge of the sea and shanties has been passed down through the family. Our ship will go ten knots at least. The push a well I want supply. While we've got grog, we'll never say die. Hurrah, we're outward bound. Hurrah, we're outward bound. You have to realise these songs were never written in the way you'd write a, a piece of classical music or something, yeah. you know, or even a musical song. They, the people who wrote them were basically musically illiterate and, and uh, many of them probably were actually uh, illiterate in terms of writing and reading yeah. as well. So they, they made them up. This restored sail ship, the Phoenix, built in 1929, takes a crew of just 10 people to guide its 80 ton weight along the calm waters of the Solent. 
I've never been on a boat like this before. This is the biggest sailing vessel I've ever been on. It's, a, it's absolutely amazing. But back in the 1920s, a similar square rigger, the Peking, was sailed in the traditional way, with few labor-saving devices and even fewer safety features. Its sailors had to be tough, working four hours on and four hours off, 24 hours a day, for the entire length of their voyage. Keeping the ship moving relied on synchronized labor, be it raising the anchor, winding up ropes or adjusting sails. To help them, the sailors used the sea shanties that had been sung for generations. We'll, we'll have a, a go at some hand over hand pulling. What um, shanty are we going to do? I think perhaps if we use the, uh, the old drunken sailor. People Which can, everyone knows. Yeah, people can join in. Okay, me? so this is. This well, is it's just like that. Okay. Oh, what shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? Early in the morning. Because they were work songs, shanties had plenty of rhythm, but little by way of a tune. In the morning. It's very invigorating, you know, the breezes in your face and the, the pulling of the ropes and singing. I think, yeah, it gets the heart pumping, it starts to feel a lot, a lot, a lot less green. Hauling long ropes could involve up to 20 men. Songs for this use lots of verses and a lead singer or shanty man to keep everyone in unison. You all look very nervous about this. Songs like Ruben Ranzo. Have you heard of Ruben Ranzo? That's my bit, right. the shanty man. And then the, the gang sing uh, Ranzo, boys, Ranzo, and they pull on okay. Ranzo, yeah? Yeah. This is a small ship and uh, we've got rather a lot of people to pull this rope. On a, a really big ship, the lads would hardly be singing this sort of grunt. So it's not singing like, yeah. not, you know, you, I know you... Not like you, the eye train. Like ah, no, oh, no. no, it's the exact okay. opposite. So if, if it, it sounds a bit odd, you know, don't be frightened. It's all it's historically just, accurate. It's, a, well, it's not your singing voice, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Oh, Ruben Ranzo! Ranzo, me voice! Ranzo! Ranzo. Oh, God, oh, it's harder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> OK. Oh, poor old Ruben Ranzo! This song was first sung on whaling ships, but quickly became popular with British sailors. Ranzo, me voice! Ranzo! Hey! I'm still smiling. <laughs> <laughs> no rope burns, which is good. No, you're all right, are you? I'm, yeah, it's hard work on the hands, bad. though, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah, well, all that you, sea salt. And... What, what does Sam's hands look like? What do your hands look you like? You must have. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Calluses. These are songs with a real purpose. And when you're pulling on the rope, you can really feel that they've got a, they're the right length, they're, they're the right rhythm for, for the work that you're doing. And it, it just feels absolutely natural. No one's listening. We're just out here on the waves. It's really it's great. It's very different from the sort of singing I'd, I'm usually involved in. Sailors on the Peking had some of the most treacherous jobs in the industry. In high winds, singing shanties was the only means of working in unison. These men had to climb up the rigging to fold away sails. But even high-risk tasks like these had a shanty. When I'll shave another chin, to me. I think what's so tantalising for me about this is that there was an era where people sang on a daily basis for just the work songs and for each other's pleasure, and we can never ever hear that. We can never really understand what those people thought or how they felt, but we can get very, very close to it by singing the songs ourselves and being out here on the waves. And I find that incredibly powerful because it just connects you with the past in a way that I think no history book ever can. Yes, thanks so, very yeah, much thanks indeed. a lot. I look to Thanks, Skipper.
Thanks very much. Yep. That was really good. Found my sea legs. Yeah, thanks very really. much for having us. Yeah. Love yeah. to see you. Oh, yeah, fine. Yeah. Though shanties began as work songs, they quickly grew into something more powerful, telling the stories of sailors' lives and emotions. Nowhere was this more true than in the coal industry of England's northeast. Gareth's next destination. By the 1840s, thousands of men were employed mining coal around the River Tyne and loading it onto sail ships called collier brigs. These small, fast ships ferried millions of tons of coal to London every year. And on board, a unique set of sailor songs emerged. Morning. Morning. Gareth's meeting Jim McGeehan to find out more. Hi, Gareth. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. I'm Jim. Son of a dock worker and brother of a merchant seaman, Jim's passionate about this area's history and its songs. This was a very important area uh, for sailing ships, yeah. a particular type of sailing ship, uh, the Collier Brig, and uh, there were thousands of these uh, in this port. This, this was a very difficult harbour. There, there was a sandbar. There's a lot of rocks the out there. A lot of rocks. Those are the Black Middens, and many, many ships went aground uh, on those rocks. On this coast, 70% of them were, were wrecked or lost at sea in some way, sank, sank uh, or fires, whatever, and lost at sea in some way, 70%. And one in five of the men employed in the, in the Collier Brig trade lost their lives at sea, one in That's five. That's a shocking yeah. statistic. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. what a dangerous profession. Yeah. Many sailors' deaths were caused by ships running aground on the rocks, despite the beacons from lighthouses like St Mary's. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's a long way up. That's a good acoustic. <laughs> hey! Oh, it's great. Great place to sing. A little bit more to go. Oh, right. Gets I've... steeper now. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you have to remember to come down backwards like the sailors did. Oh, OK. Oh, right, we're going right into the, oh, the yeah. light. Mind your head. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Great place. The most famous maritime story in these parts took place in gale force winds during the early hours of September the 7th, 1838. A shipwreck was spotted by a lighthouseman, William Darling, and his 23-year-old daughter, Grace. She rowed with her father through violent seas to the wreck of the Forfarshire, a cargo and passenger ship. It had broken in two, and the only survivors were clinging to the rocks. Their rescue shot Grace to Victorian fame, a cult status celebrated in song. Had it been a man doing that rescue, it probably wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have made it, and yet everyone in the country knew this wonderful song about Grace Darling, you know? And she pulled away o'er the dashing spray Over the stormy sea Help, help, you could hear the cry of the shipwrecked crew But Grace had an English heart the raging storm she braved, she pulled away o'er the dashing spray and the crew she saved. Hey, hooray! <laughs> yeah, very stirring. I was taught a song at school. Oh, they built the ship Titanic to sail the ocean blue. And they thought they'd built a ship that the water would never get through. But the Lord's almighty hand said that ship will never land. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad, mighty sad. It was sad when that great ship went down. Husbands and lives, that were husbands and wives, little children lost their lives. It was sad when that great ship went down. <laughs> the most inappropriate tune. Absolutely. Clearly not written by a sailor. No, no. John, come tell us as we haul away. We were outward bound for Mobile Bay. The danger of the sea was a fact of life for every sailor. As their collier brigs were prepared for the next voyage, they knew they might never return. And to calm their anxiety, they wrote songs called Outward Bounders. Many of these songs have been kept alive by being passed down from father to son. Jim and his group, the Keelers, 
are passionate about this tradition and regularly stage special performances for the public. What's the first one we're doing? It's called I'm Bound Away. It was an outward bounder, so the sailors would sing it when they were heading out of uh, Shields Harbour and uh, heading for, for points north or south, whenever. They would uh, sing this to maybe their wives or sweethearts or daughters that are... Or both. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> left behind uh, on the quayside. For the sake of you, me lassie, I'm bound away, me lassie. For the sake of you, me lassie, I'm bound away. For across the sea, me lassie, I'm bound away, me lassie. Going to fight for you, me lassie, I'm bound away. Each day, me lassie, I'm bound away, me lassie, for the sake of you, me lassie, I'm bound away. This must have been a noisy place. Yeah, I mean, a, a forest of masts would have existed in this harbour. I think every sailor would have a, a handful of songs in his repertoire that he would know. I in suppose the... it's like football chants today. Yeah, as soon as one person starts it, everybody joins exactly. in. Exactly. And like football chants, of course, being sung in a very male environment. But they wouldn't have been sung on, on shore even, would they? Never, they no, never no. for an audience. Always... No, no, no. There was, uh, sailors were very superstitious and, and they wouldn't sing their, their work songs ashore. They wouldn't sing outward bounders on a homeward bound voyage and vice versa. They yeah. were very superstitious. They wouldn't whistle aboard the ship. The, the tradition now of not whistling on stage for actors comes from ships. Because of the rigging, yes. Yeah, what was the, why wouldn't you whistle? Because the ship's whistle was a, sig a, um, a signal. Ah, possibly. It was referred to by the sailors as whistling up the devil. So when, if you whistled, the, the, the devil would appear and could bring all sorts of uh, foul weather and things like that. I should be sure not to whistle. <laughs> What is it about shanties for you? Why, why do you sing them? Shanties are folk songs, and I'm interested in folk song in general. But um, I think quite a large uh, part of the, of the, the, the folk song um, tradition in this country has turned its back on the sea shanties. They're, they're sort of a neglected area of folk song. Um, that then that, that, that's, that's part of the, of the appeal to me. I love this, the thought of, of these guys out there singing songs whilst doing something so practical and so dangerous because I think we have a view in this country of singing as something rather effete and namby-pamby and in, in sea shanties and sea songs like these there's nothing wet about them well apart from the spray in your face as you sing it you know they're very very manly and strong and I just find that, that history really interesting by the middle of the 19th century the arrival of steam power had begun to make working shanties redundant. Today, we only know about the few songs that were written down and can only guess at how they sounded. But a family in nearby Sunderland have invited Gareth to hear an incredibly rare and remarkable archive. Hi. Hi, Ian. Nice to meet you. Hi, Celia. Great. You've got stuff to show me. Yeah. And that is Captain Mark Page, his son Edward, his son Edward, and his son Edward. So this is your great 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 grandfather. Great great grandfather. Yeah. And we have just discovered he sang sea shanties. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Captain Mark Page became an unlikely recording artist when American music enthusiast James Madison Carpenter decided to record his sea shanties in the 1920s in a mission to save these songs from extinction. Let's have a listen to this then, shall we? His wax cylinder recordings are locked away in Washington's Library of Congress. But by the wonders of modern technology, Washington can be brought to a living room in Sunderland. All the way, Joe. Oh, 
Uh, Sounds like he's trying to remember the word. (laughs) Wow, that's amazing. (laughs) It's a real voice voice out of the past, isn't it? Yeah. So he was a captain. He had a long career at sea, didn't he? Yes, he did. (laughs) We've got this. Captain Page was with a native of Shoreham, Sussex, and worked on a farm before making his mind up to run away to sea at the age of 13. Although the life is hard, he found it to his taste and eventually commanded a number of sailing ships. He was a popular and picturesque figure down on the riverside. How wonderful to have a picturesque uh, <laughs> great-great-grandfather. I mean, he would absolutely never have imagined that we'd be sitting here. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. Listening to yeah. him. He's not famous, yeah. he's sort of not a celebrity, yeah. Yeah. and yet here he is. Yeah. We're listening to him. It's just, I think that's remarkable. It's wonderful. It's I think it's quite Yeah, remarkable. you're really lucky to have that. It's miraculous that somebody went and recorded these songs, these songs that probably nobody thought were very important. And all we have is a little crackly old wax roll that only just about sounds like somebody singing, but there's a voice there, a voice from the past that, that I found that amazing. When you hear the actual voice of an actual man who was on the boats at that time, it validates the whole thing. It really brings it straight to your mind in a way that that no modern retelling of a song can ever do. Hearing the actual voice is something so, so evocative of the past. Some of our most powerful sea songs have come from the rich traditions of Britain's fishing communities. Like the one in Filey Bay on the Yorkshire coast. During the 1800s, Filey's fishing industry thrived, enough to keep more than 50 boats busy and even export to Portugal. But like much of the UK, fishing here has been hit by quotas and competition from abroad. Today, just a handful of Filey's boats remain. Despite the decline, the fishermen's songs live on through the Filey Fisherman's Choir. Hello, gentlemen. Hi, I'm Gareth. The choir boasts a wealth of retired longliners, salmon fishermen and trawlermen. I'm Gareth. Average age, 70. Hi, nice to meet you. On life's white sea, all trust in me, with dauntless hearts we roam. No storm we fear, the havens near, we're sailing, sailing home. Sailing, sailing, sailing home. For more than a century, fishermen like these have been belting out religious sea songs from a Methodist hymn book called Sacred Songs and Solos. These aren't work songs, but songs of praise, asking for protection from danger on the ocean waves. And Jesus shall the pilot be, we're safe. I, I want to clap, but we're in a church. I'm just going give you a clap. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Another fresh up now. Oh right, okay. I'll do what I can. Yeah, we'll do it. Oh gosh. You do I'll just wave my arms and you sing. Jesus at thy command, for thee I But Filey's fishermen haven't always been so holy. They once had a fearsome reputation for drinking and debauchery. With one local report describing their swearing, gambling fighting and heinous crimes. Hello, Hello. Jim. Hey, Gareth, Jim. come in. Thanks. Former lobster and salmon fisherman Jim Haxby and his family have a long association with the choir and know all about the bizarre way that the Filey fishermen found God. The fisherman's choir started approximately in 1823. Wow. A chap called Johnny Oxterby came to Filey to try and convert the hard-drinking, swearing fishermen but they didn't want to know anything about it. 
and it was pelted with dried skate. The chest him out of town, he slept in the field up here, and um, he came back the next day, did the same thing, and he conquered Farley, and that was the start of religion and of the Fisherman's Choir. So the tradition of religious song goes right back to 1823 in Farley. Yeah. Amazing. That's my great-grandfather, Matthew Oxby. In the late 1800s, he was the uh, leader of the Fowler Fisherman's Choir. I was brought up in the chapel at Fowler, the Fisherman's Chapel. OK, so you're descended from a conductor. Yeah. And did you always sing? Did, you, did, your, did your parents sing as well? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. My father's family, there were seven of them, they all liked singing, not just singing, but what they were singing. Yeah. We don't know shanties, but we sing the next thing, which are hymns of the sea. We don't preach as such, but if you want a sermon, listen to the words. Mm. There's one in every verse. It's not hard to understand a fisherman's need for faith, given the perils of the job. Jim knows of many men who've died at sea. Can you tell a fisherman's grave from somebody else's grave? Do they? Yes. Yeah, you see, you've got a cobble there. Oh, on yes. The sail. Yeah, but, yeah. Robert Skelton, who was lost near Farley Bay from the Cobble Mary, 1885, aged 41 years. He the was... water flowed on every side. No friend was there to save. At last, they sank beneath the tide and found a watery grave. So if you just walk around and, you know, you see the boats... And there's and... an anchor there, there's a boat there. Oh, that's right, yeah. There are, there are loads of them, aren't there? Yes. With the old men that have gone before and that and remember them by their favourite song. Mm. You know, the, oh, so when you start to sing it, you think, oh, this is... That, that was his. Terry's, yeah. My favourite, the haven of rest. That's what I want putting on the grave. Mm. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the dark surge in deep. In Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Jesus, I'm safe evermore. I yield myself to his tender embrace and faith taking hold of the world. What I love about this group is there's a real sense of the triumph of the human spirit and will and passion because these songs should and could end up just fading away and staying on a, on, on a shelf. But because these guys really believe in them and really love them, they are kept alive and kept fresh. And I, I really admire that. And this uh, look in their eye that really speaks of their life experience and their feeling for the song. And it's not the look in the eye of a professional musician, it's the look in the eye of somebody who just loves what they're doing and doesn't really care about uh, whether you're enjoying it almost. It's just it's, they're singing for them, they're singing for each other. I find that deeply, deeply powerful. We got there in the end. Thank you very much. It was a fair and a pleasant day. Oh, the first sea song that Gareth learnt as a child was a Scottish song called Shoals of Herring about a part of our fishing industry where women played a major part. Between 1860 and 1940, Scottish herring fleets were at their peak, travelling to sea for months at a time. And whilst the men were away, a huge burden of work fell on the wives and daughters they left behind. Gareth's been invited to Gardenstown near Aberdeen. Are you Irene? I am. I'm Gareth. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Hi. Welcome to Gamedy in this blustery day. Oh, lovely summer day here in <laughs> Scotland. Fantastic. <laughs> Irene Watts is a folk musician who's determined to preserve the songs of the men and women of Gardenstown. Now you're up on deck, you're a fisherman. You can swear and show a manly bear. Take a turn on watch with the other fellow. Born and bred here, Irene knows all about the community's unique history. Night and day we're fairing. Come winter wind or winter gales, sweat or cold, growing up 
Crueno and dying as you hunt the bonny shoals of heaven. That was my dad's favourite song. Oh, that, that's one of my favourites. <laughs> Love that song. More. That's another one. <laughs> Most of Gardens Town's houses have been sold as holiday cottages, but they were once home to fishermen's wives. It strikes me that most people think about the fishing industry, think about men, but the fisherwomen were really important as well. What did they do? They had a huge role to play. I mean, quite frankly, the fishing industry here would yeah. not have survived without the women. Really? Um, because not only what, of course, the men were out doing the fishing. Yeah. But they did all the sort of preparation. For example, this bit along here is uh, where they used to have all the sort of fish processing yards. And, I mean, there have been fish curers, there was a Kipring shed, and oh, my great uncle what's that? Kipring. What's a Kipring shed? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not well, up to the. You know lingo. a kipper that you have for breakfast? Yeah. Oh, okay, well, a Kipring shed. Yeah. Sorry. Most of these would have been net stores. Right. You know, uh, where you'd have. Mended nets, and of course yeah. that was very much the sort of women's domain as well. So they'd have just been sat out here. On... Well, you wouldn't, yeah, inside. You know, right. it would have been all sort of strung up with nets, and they'd have been darning away and all that kind of thing. They all had their stoves, of course, to keep warm. Yep. And also, they had to carry the men out to the boats. The women. What? They had <laughs> carry to them. carry the men. What was wrong? Because uh, they were paralytic from the <laughs> night before. <laughs> no, no. But it was very important that a fisherman didn't get his feet wet or, you know, get wet before they started fishing. Why? Because they wore such thick socks underneath their um, yeah. sea boots yes. to keep their feet w warm. Oh, I see. So they, they wouldn't wet, want to get wet They wouldn't too get soon. their wet. Because that was before the days of sort of harbours and things like yeah. that, when they would have just sort of pulled the boat up. Mm. And then we would have carried them out on their backs to the boats. These are strong so, women. Strong women, yes. You're from strong stock. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I, so yes. I won't make you carry me around on this tour. <laughs> Worrying about their husbands and caring for their children led the women to write emotionally charged sea songs to help them and their families to cope. You know, we have a lot of lullabies along the coast. Um, fishing lullabies. Oh, really? It does so much more than just soothe and comfort a baby. Yeah. You know, a lullaby can also comfort the mother. Yes. And a lot of lullabies throughout tradition, not only in fishing, but they, they're all about anxiety and missing fathers and things like yeah. that. And the fishing ones are no different, you know. Um, and it's one way of sort of keeping the family together, everything will be all right. There's always that element of hope in them, you know. So... You've got an example. I'll sing you a wee bit one. This is, this is a, a lullaby from the fisherman's wife. Run my name, my blessings three. Pray for daddy on the sea. Bonnie Ben is sent to cheer. Keep my heart from dread and fear. Keep my heart from dread and fear. Yeah. Fishermen's daughters were also crucial to this community. From the age of 13, the girls of Gardenstown would pack up a chest of their belongings and travel the coast as gutting girls. Hard-working young women who earned money by gutting and packing herring, travelling from the Shetland Islands right down to Yarmouth. These girls' remarkable lives are still celebrated in Gardenstown. So Eleanor's the curator here. She's done loads of work. She works with all the photographs and blows them all up. Oh, they're great. These talks and things for school. Are these girls from this town? Yes. yes so are. you're probably related to some of them, are you? Well, my mother's from this one. Here. Oh, really? Yes. Which one's your mother? My mother's shaken from the left here. Second, oh, yes. That looks like dirty work. Their fingers are all... They really enjoyed it, actually. Did Although they? It was really hard work and everything. They did enjoy it. Yeah. And there was a great camaraderie between them all. To keep spirits up, the girls would sing songs rich in the traditions of Gaelic folk music. So it wasn't always about what they were doing. Yes. I think their singing was more of a 
social interaction. As you're doing something monotonous, keep yes. your brain going. Yes. Come on, you fish and lassies, new and come away with me. Fikir and bulg and game re and fe and varalahi. Fe bucky and fe aberdeen and all the country rune. Where a wate got the hair and where a wate yarmouth tune. I've got it fish and lerwick eye and storm awa and shields. I've worked along the humber amongst the barrels and the creels. And whip. Be Grimsby, I've travelled up and down, but the place to see the heron is the key at Yarmouth Toon. So come my you fish and lassies new and come awa with me. Fikir and bulg and game re and fe in Varalahi. Fe Bucky and fe Aberdeen and a the country rune. But the place to see the heron is the key at Yarmouth Toon. Hmm, it's great. <laughs> yeah. It really it tells a story it actually. It does, yeah, it puts you right there. Everything else I've heard have been songs that are based out there at sea and they're men's songs and they're quite macho and they're to do with, with, with the, the, the business of being a fisherman or a sailor. And these women's songs are giving me a whole different perspective. It's a social history about the things that women did, the, how they were involved in the industry, how they brought up the children, how they worried about their men while they were out at sea. And it's a fascinating insight because you really under, understand through the women's plight what it was to live in those times and, and it was a tough life. The story of the Gutting Girls isn't completely lost to history books. Two of them still live in Gardenstown. Hello. 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 Now, this is... Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Hi, I'm Gareth. <laughs> Who is... Hi. This Maggie is 93. 93? Yes. Wow. And this is another Maggie. Hello, Maggie. Who is 97. I'm Gareth. Hello. No what one. year would this have been that you were gutting Heron? What about? year would that have been, Maggie? Oh, well, I was 1930, maybe. I was married in 1935. Right. 15. Was I away at 14? I went to Shetland. So you went to Shetland 14, at 14 years old 14 first. years old. Was it hard? It was hard. Have you got any scars? No. No, you're OK. <laughs> ah, the scars. <laughs> the scars, are they? And I'll bet this... Did the sting? Eh? Did the sting? Oh, yes, with the oh. salt. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you had... Did you just get on with it? You yes. just got on, yeah. So they me? get paid per barrel? Ten pence per barrel. Ten Between. pence a barrel? Between three. Between three? <laughs> yes. 3.3 .3 pence a See, barrel. The faster you got it, the more money. Wow. When you were working, would you sing songs to each other? Sometimes. I don't like Monday morning, I would rather stay in bed. <laughs> when I'm toddling off to work and wishing I were dead. <gasps> Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday brings me no delight. I don't like Monday morning. I would rather have Saturday night. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I, <love it. laughs> I bet. I bet you <laughs> felt like that. <laughs> yes. yes. We had fun. Yeah. No money. No money. No but money. But good fun. Fun. But good. But lots of girls together. Must have yes. been great. No, we just did it our own hearts. Yeah. Maggie says that they used to sing. I belong to Glasgow, dear old Glasgow town. There's nothing the matter with Glasgow when it's going round and round. But when I get a couple of drinks on a Saturday, Glasgow belongs to me. So there you go. Many of our most enduring songs of the sea are testimony to the bravery of heroes. So Garrett's off to Whitby on the North Yorkshire coast to hear some of this music. Local singers, Kimber's men, have dedicated themselves to singing and writing songs celebrating these heroes of the sea. 
On the 21st of October, before the rising sun, we formed a line for action, boys, at 12 o'clock begun. Bold Nelson to his men did say, The Lord will prosper us this day. Give them the broadside, fire away. On board a man of war, let him die in peace. God bless you all, on board a man of war. From broadside to broadside, our cannonballs did fly. Like hailstones to small shot, upon our deck did lie. Our mast and rigging were shot away. Likewise, some thousands on that day were killed or wounded in the fray. On board a man of war, let him die in peace. God bless you all, on board a man of war. Very good, very hearty stuff. <laughs> I'm the hero, of course. Yeah, that's a great, great <laughs> one. Great. What, what's amazing is that these acts of heroism get put into the songs, and I think it, that all of that, that mythology around it that builds up, it's what inspires people and what, what keeps people wanting to go to sea and wanting to do that, because you hear these great tales, and when you hear, the, hear them put into a song, you, I don't know, they have a sort of... have a, a mystical quality about them. It was in Whitby that a famously heroic sea rescue took place, an event that united the entire community. Hello, are you Peter? Hi, Peter Thompson, yes. who yes. runs the local lifeboat museum, Thanks. comes from a family of lifeboat men for whom the story is an inspiration. That is beautiful. He came out of active service in 1957. Wow. How many That's, men is uh, that? One, two, three, four. Thirteen altogether. Ten oars on Coxon, second Coxon and Bowman. It was from this former lifeboat house, during terrible storms in 1881, that the Robert Whitworth lifeboat was launched. Its mission was to rescue cargo ship, the Visitor, which had hit rocks in Robin Hood's Bay. But because the sea was too rough, it had to take an extraordinary route. There were six people in imminent danger of drowning in a storm, and the coxswain here decided that uh, the Whitby lifeboat could be taken over land through the snowdrifts six miles uh, and have a go at rescuing. Six miles? That was the Robert Whitworth, yes. OK. This exact kind of boat? Yes, exactly the same. The whole thing, we're looking at between five and six tonne. Wow. And uh, it would be taken out of this boathouse. Uh, the, pull it by men on long, long ropes across the bridge, and then, of course, you've got to get up out of Whitby. The simple story is that up to 300 men and 16 and more horses took it right over land, down the hill at Robin Hood's Bay. Amazing. Shovel the snow, lad, seven feet tall, who's a pounding, clear and haul. Clear and haul, lads, clear and haul. Who's a pounding, clear and haul? Captain Gibson, here are plea. Six men's lives in peril at sea. Send the boat, oh, send the boat. The Whitby visitor is no more. Shovel the snow, lad, seven feet tall. Who's a pounding? Kimber's men have written their own tribute to this remarkable clear rescue. And haul, lads, clear and haul. Who's a pounding clear and haul? Fantastic, that's great. That's it's put me right there. Thank you. <laughs> really good. good. That's a hell of a yeah. bass you've got there. Thank you very much. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna be a hell of a mess when his voice breaks though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grab the shovels, see In eighteen eighty one, it took the people of Whitby four hours to haul the Robert Whitworth six miles over land on a wooden trailer. When they reached Robin Hood's Bay, time was running out for the crew of the visitor, who'd been clinging to their boat in freezing waters. But before they could be reached, the lifeboat still had to be hauled through the narrow streets. Harness fastened, leathers tight, ne'er anyone had seen such sight. The group's founder member, Neil Kimber, knows the story well. 
There were between two and four hundred men actually hauling the lifeboat. Um, and when they get to this stage, they've got to get it down this steep hill uh, without it running down and wrecking in the bottom, really. Yeah. And, I mean, this series of corners here is, this is, is unbelievable, you know. Yeah. Um, and there was a, a team actually pulling cottage walls down really? to get the boat through. Uh, and pulling bushes over and, and ripping bushes up out of the ground. Destroying old ladies' yeah. gardens. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. That been... gap there just does not look wide enough no. to get a boat round. No, no. It, it's, uh, it's very small and, and turning it on the corner is uh, just inconceivable, really. There's one person whose contribution stands out. That of the lifeboat coxswain, Henry Freeman. As exhaustion set in for the rescuers, it was his courageous leadership that kept them going. It remains a source of pride for his descendants. He did do a marvellous job, and that's why we're so proud of him. I must say, he's a big man. Look at the picture, he just booms out at you. It was a very unique act that happened. It was a community that was brought together for one purpose, and that was to save lives. And to me, that should never, ever be forgotten. You just feel so proud that you're part of that. It took two attempts before the rescue was finally successful. Well, they rode for an hour and they picked up the crew of the visitor then, who were semi-conscious, most of them. Some were unconscious, mm. virtually frozen to death. And when they brought them in, some of the guys didn't even realise that they'd been saved and they got them onto dry land and they were asking where they were and some were still unconscious. All for six men. All for six men, yeah. But local men. And, yeah. Um, fishermen are very precious about their relatives and friends. Probably some of them would be related anyway. And uh, the traditions of the sea are that if someone else is in danger, you go out you and go save out lives. Yeah. yeah, it's a very inspiring story. Try again, we shall not fail. Eighteen men shall fight the gale. Hours pass, men hauled aboard, white horses crashing to the bay. Pull the oars, lads, seven feet tall, waves are pounding, heave and haul. To be the kind of person about whom songs are written, I mean, that's really to have lived, isn't it? You know, to be people still singing songs about you 150 years after your, your death because you went out to sea and, and saved lives. I mean, that's incredible. Pull the oars, lads, seven feet tall. Waves are pounding, heave and haul. Heave and haul, lads, heave and haul. Waves are pounding, heave and haul. Fantastic. And here are the 200 people to pull the lifeboat back to Whitby. <laughs> the singing Garrett's heard has been an inspiration. But the centuries-old hymns of fishermen, the shanties from the great days of sail, and the songs of fisher wives are no longer central to the communities they came from. But the final part of his journey Garrett's visiting a place where the tradition of sea songs continues to thrive. Port Isaac on Cornwall's north coast has managed to hold on to its fishing industry and its musical heritage. It's quite calm out yeah, today. It's lovely calm today. Great. You'll enjoy it today. Where are you taking me? We're taking you just off barely, about a mile, and then we're going to haul it back a pot. You're going to haul what? A back of pots, which is what we call a back of pots. There's 25 pots in a string. OK. Laid on the seabed. Brilliant. Crabs and lobsters. Oh, lovely. Yeah. John Brown and his brothers are fifth-generation fishermen. Together with other locals, they still sing sea songs as part of their everyday lives. All right. Morning. Hello, Gareth. I'm John. Good to meet you, John. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Shanties like rattling winches 
perfectly fit the rhythms and speed needed when hauling lobster pots. In the hold, this gear must go. Yeah. Rattle and winches, oh! Or Mr. Mate just told me so. Woo. Rattle and winches, oh! Rattle and down and stump and go. Rattle and winches, oh! Woo. Rattle and down and stump and go. Rattle and winches, oh! Just one more rattle and then belay. Rattle and winches, oh! We rattle ah. this gear enough to turn. Woo. Rattle and winches, oh! Rattle and down and stump and go. Rattle and winches, oh! They're so inspired by their fishing songs, the men have even formed a band and regularly give performances. There is a lot of singing in Cornwall, isn't there? It's oh, a absolutely. Rich, a rich tradition. A big English tradition. Yeah. Yeah. It's back a long way. We've, we've done a lot of our Cornish songs when we started, didn't we, for the first four or five years. Yeah. And then to liven it up again, we just help ourselves along a bit on the road to singing. We went on to shanties. Yeah. What yeah, is it about so. shanties? Well, I just get just in a bit, and get it's in a bit of that. Go. Seems appropriate yeah. for Port Isaac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it makes you think you're roughy tuffy. Right. <laughs> and uh, you've got another song, something more gentle. Another love song. Another. Billy's got a very lovely, quiet love song. Cornish love song. I've never seen the like since I've been born. A great big sailor with his sea boots on. When Johnny comes down the high low, poor old man. Man, I wake her, I shake her, I wake that girl. Across the sea, she's a beige and booty, and she says to me, When Johnny comes down the high low, poor old man, I'll wake her, I'll shake her, I'll wake that girl with a blue dress on. When Johnny comes down the high low, poor old man, Did you ever see the old plantation boss with a long tail filly and a big black horse? When Johnny comes down the high low, poor old man, I'll wake her, I'll shake her, I'll wake that girl with a blue dress on. When Johnny comes down the high low, poor old man. Ah, okay. Shorts and yeah. It's not genteel, this is it? <laughs> These men continue to write songs inspired by their rich seafaring history. Like the tragic story of neighbouring village, Port Quinn. 300 years ago, a violent storm brought devastation here when the men of the village were drowned at sea. Port Quinn has been haunted by the events ever since. Here we are. You can still see the old wooden lintels over the doorway here. Today, just a short distance from the port and covered in bushes, lie the relics of this old community and its handful of ruined cottages. <laughs> so what's this? It's on the market. <laughs> <laughs> Going cheap, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's nice. just two or three old abandoned cottages here, Gareth. And I mean, you see the old um, fireplace there, which would have been on the upper floor. Well, I think there's about two foot of debris in here now. Yeah. But this is, uh, this is Port, part of Port Quinn, which was abandoned over the years. There was a big um, traumatic disaster here in around 1698, when the fleet set sail as they did every day. And the entire fleet was um, wiped out by a northeasterly gale that came in and um, over the course of about two hours and, and just completely sank the whole fleet and left two dozen widows in the village in one day. Gosh. Yeah. So maybe in one of these old cottages every day a boy would come past, maybe delivering things to the village, mm. maybe, I don't know, delivering milk, delivering groceries from nearby Port Isaac, and would have seen an old lady sort of sitting here looking out at that window and it still had a bit of glass in there and wonder why she looked so haunted and what was the matter with her. And, that might have been the last widow that um, was left from the great storm of 1698. Hmm. Nice idea. Yeah. Let's hear it. Why do you look, widow woman? Why do you stare out at me? It's a secret you keep in your heart Buried deep of a boy on the bed of the sea In Port Quinn there's a clouded glass window 
Panes cracked and frames dusty dried For the boy that drowned lies in Mole's Island Sound The last widow still drowning in tears mm. It's lovely. We brought it to life, thank you. They sound as they do, and it has the power that it that it has because they are from here. It's like a it's like locally sourced food. You know, it tastes better because it's from a particular area, and it really feels like that. The you know the the, the 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 hills around here are alive with the sound of people singing sea songs and shanties. It's it's great. It's very potent. <laughs> It's the end of Gareth's journey, and he's been invited to join John Brown and his band for a favourite Port Isaac ritual, Friday night Songs of the Sea. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, lovely to see you. We're the Fisherman's Friends, and it'd be lovely for us to sing to you some of our sea shanties and Songs of the Sea tonight. In South Australia, I was born. Oh, away, for Gareth. The celebration of our songs of the sea is the perfect way to keep them alive. You cannot put these kinds of songs in a little jar and put them on a shelf. It's not a museum. It's not. Uh, we're not. We're, it's not dusty. Um, we're, it's. It's very vital. They've got to be brought out and sung by vibrant individuals in the community where they belong. The songs that we sing, they were singing 50 years, 100 years ago, sort of thing, and, and we still love them, you see. So these children being introduced to it this way, you never know. When they get older and middle-aged, they, they'll, they'll remember all that, and they may try doing it themselves, harmonising and singing songs of the sea. One thing creased me mind. Oh. Heave away, haul away. Bustle Miss Nancy Blair behind. We're bound for South Australia. Haul away. I'm really proud that we in Britain have these great songs. Yes, uh, there are wonderful songs from all around the world, but we have something that's really great here, and it's wonderful to see people enjoying them and just singing for the sheer love of singing it, for the sheer love of, of their shared cultural heritage. And these guys really get something from singing that is what I crave from singing. It's that there's something spiritual about it, there's something sort of emotional, and there's something fun as well about it, and I, I think it's wonderful. Round Cape Horn, we're bound for South Australia.